And um, I've kind of backed up a little bit here because, you know, after a while your brain just sort of shuts down after two hours of listening to me. So, um, so where we are now is we're looking at um, the metabolism section. We did the communication section. Y'all remember what we did with communication? We talked about um, <coughs> secretion, endocrine secretion, neurotransmitter secretion, paracrine secretion, autocrine secretion, and we talked about electrical signaling being like nerve impulses. Okay, so with metabolism, the first thing is that you can have the breakdown, the catabolism events. So we went through those a little bit, and I told you that we're really not going to get into a lot of detail on test one about catabolic events. When, it, when you talk about um, glycolysis and fermentation and aerobic respiration, all of those things are stuff that we study in more detail in ANP2. So that whole last section of chapter three on metabolism. We have pulled out of ANP1 and stuck in, we've plugged it right into ANP2 because that's when we do digestion and nutrition and it makes more sense there. So we're just at this point getting this little tiny bit of an introduction and because all the text on the slides is posted for you, all the information you see up there, just not the pictures, is available online so you'll know what you need to know for the test. Okay, not very much on metabolism. The only other um, aspect about that I would caution you about is to make sure if it's in a practice quiz or in the Learn Smart, make sure that you learn it. Okay? All right, so enough said about that. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about synthesis. We're actually going to get bogged down in protein synthesis to some extent because proteins rule the world, okay, at least within a cell. Even though cell products can be carbohydrates or lipid as well, it's the proteins that are the boss because they are the enzymes. And enzymes determine what chemical reactions are going to proceed in a cell, and all enzymes are proteins. Okay? I'm going to put a little asterisk on that. There are some uh, RNAs that are shown to have catalytic function. We call them ribozymes. They're inside the ribosome. But other than that, all known catalytic organic molecules are proteins. All enzymes are proteins. Okay? And you've got to have proteins no matter what. So the proteins are in charge of the rest of the metabolic functions. When you get into AMP2, we'll also talk more in detail about building carbs and building lipids. But for now, we're not going to go there. We're just going to learn about protein synthesis because the proteins are where the action is. I've got to get my tapping figure down. It's an operator error. So um, here's an exhaustive list of, well, it's probably not even a complete list, but you've got proteins that have their jobs inside of the cells. That includes not only the enzymes, but the structural proteins, which include the elements of the cytoskeleton. What is a cytoskeleton? What is that? It's, a, it's a, a network of fibrous proteins within a cell that maintains the cell shape. Okay, so when you're looking at weird sh shaped cells like neurons, how do they maintain their shape? They have a cytoskeleton which is made of protein, and they're very specific protein. You also have specialized protein. Some of these are on the list. Keratin repels water. We'll study that more detail when we get to the skin. Myosin and actin are found in not just muscle tissues, but wherever you find them together, they're involved in contraction. Hemoglobin, of course, for oxygen transport. That's just sort of a short list. Um, our receptors for all those little chemical messengers we called ligands are protein. You have receptors in two locations. Some are in the membrane, some are intracellular. And then you have some regulatory proteins. I should have hormones on that list. Please add it to the bottom. Let me see if I can add that real quick.
think I'm running out of room. Okay, not. It just must be too low on the page. All right, you get the sense of what I'm trying to do. Add hormones to regulatory proteins. Chromosomal proteins we're going to look at very briefly. I just want you to know they exist. It's much, much too much information for y'all to try to feel like you're going to master. But it's important for you to understand how chromosomes are regulated. Okay? So we'll be looking at some animations of that that uh, I'll be trying to pull up anyway. All right. And that's just the intracellular guy. So also there are cells that secrete proteins. They are the secretory products of some cells. Some of them stay put in the local extracellular fluid. This includes enzymes that have a local effect, uh, proteins in the matrix. The matrix is just the stuff around the cells. And that includes the collagen that we talked a little bit about yesterday. Um, some local signaling molecules, and then some of them are transported. And there you see hormones again and enzymes. All right, so how important are proteins? They're like the bedrock of life. We wouldn't be here without them, so we've got to have them. Okay, so when you, when a cell decides it's going to make proteins, we've learned a lot more about this process. When I first started teaching A&P, we taught protein synthesis as step one, a gene is transcribed, and that was it. And the amount of information we know now about that, I could teach a whole course just in how to turn the genes on and we're not going to get bogged down in it, but I do want to show you at least one example. And um, I think it helps you to know this guy, P53. Let me see if that's the link that works. Yes, it is. P53 molecule protein binds to specific sequences adjacent to genes which it controls. There's a P53 molecule binding to its site, its binding site. It recruits an RNA polymerase, not a DNA polymerase, that then makes RNA from these genes that it controls. Okay, so P53 is a protein. That protein had to be made by the gene for that protein being turned on and transcribed and translated. So you need proteins to turn on genes to make proteins. So you can see how quickly it's going to become complicated as we try to figure out how uh, protein synthesis is regulated. P53 is a particularly important one because it is involved in um, cancers. So we know a lot about P53 because we've studied the cancers that it's associated with, one of which is leukemia. And we learned a lot about gene regulation by studying those cancers. So what you see here is a different kind of gene regulation, one in which there is a steroid hormone. Can you all see that at the top of the screen? Once again, I've lost my function. So you see a steroid hormone passing through the plasma membrane entering the cell. Does everybody see that? Why does the steroid hormone enter the cell? What kind of a molecule is a steroid? Is it lipid or water soluble? It's lipid, and steroid hormones were on our list of things that can pass right through plasma membranes. So, but like everything else, if it's going to have an effect, it has to have a receptor. So there you see it's intracellular receptor. It's actually intranuclear receptor. The hormone enters the cell, binds to its receptor, and then that hormone receptor complex is binding to the DNA. And when it binds to the DNA, that turns on the gene. So I showed you an animation of a single protein that could turn on a gene. 
here is a second case of a steroid hormone turning on a gene. Does everybody see there are different ways of turning on genes? All of them involve something binding to the DNA, okay? And that initiates protein synthesis. It's still not working. Oh, there we go. So in the case of um, the steroid hormone, as it binds to the DNA, then that initiates transcription. And transcription is the process of making an RNA copy of the DNA of a gene. Is this review to everybody? Is there anybody that it's been at least a year since you've heard this stuff? So long ago that you don't remember it. Yeah, okay, sorry, you're two hands out of 30, so, okay. All right, so do you remember DNA structure? You remember it's a double helix? Nucleotides, A, G, C, and T, got that? So with transcription, what we do is we make an RNA copy of the DNA. We send that RNA copy out to the cytoplasm, to the ribosomes, where the amino acids are matched up. In the process of transcription, take a look at the steps involved. We take one of the two strands of the DNA that's called the sense strand. We can make multiple copies of the same gene all at the same time, just one right after another. We match our adenine in DNA to uracil in RNA, guanine and cytosine match, thymine in the DNA matches to adenosine in the RNA. So the, the, I think the big picture here is that where we have thymine or T in DNA, we replace it with uracil or U in RNA, okay? That's something we've known a long time, and I, I could explain why if you want. If anybody asks, I'll explain it. All right, so what happens next after that? Translation, that RNA sequence that we copied off the gene is edited in the nucleus, sent out to the cytoplasm, binds to a ribosome, and then is read off. And that sequence of reading is a sequence of three called a codon. There's always a start codon. The start codon always codes for the amino acid methionine. We happen to know sometimes that methionine will get edited off later. Um, there are 64 different possible combinations. Let's stop and think about that for a minute. If I have four different nucleotides, A, G, C, and U, and I'm gonna combine them in groups of three, how many different combinations do I have? I can have AAG, AAU, AAC, AAA. I can have AUA, AUG, AUC, AUA, so forth. Comes out to 64. If you wanna do the math, I'll be happy to show you later. Um, of those 64 combinations, only 60 of them match to amino acids. Well, one is the start codon, which happens to match to methionine, but three of them are stop codons. And when you get to a stop codon, that tells the ribosome you're done. The ribosome falls apart into two pieces. The messenger RNA is pulled off. The finished protein goes off and does its thing, okay? So the remaining 60 codons code for the different, the 20 different amino acids. What this means is that some of the codons are duplicates, okay? So you have redundancy in the code. You may have, in some cases, as many as six different codons for the same amino acid, whereas other amino acids have only one. Okay, so it's, it's not entirely random. It's based on the chemistry of them, but it looks random to us. So here is an example of the genetic code. Um, I am not gonna ask you to memorize the code. If I need you to use the code on the test, I'll give you a picture of it, okay? So let's make sure we know how to read the code. So if you started with a code that was C, G, A. How would you find what its match is? Take a second and see if you can find it yourself. Everybody find it okay? 
What's the answer? Oh, I picked an easy one. So the first position is C, the second position is G, and the third position is A, arginine. Okay? How do we know this? The, the biochemist that figured this out actually sat down in a lab with equipment that would analyze chemically each and every combination until they figured out which amino acids stuck to each other. That was probably very boring work, but boy, do we appreciate it. Okay, so we know the genetic code. This genetic code is the same for every organism that has been studied so far, with the exception of some really weird primitive bacteria that have a slightly different code. All eukaryotes, that's all of us, all the plants, all the fungi, all the little protozoans, all use the same code. All of us use the same code. Okay, so that genetic code is pretty well studied and understood. Um, if you look at the chemistry of it, what you find is that at least the first two letters, in this case C and G, have some chemical compatibility with the chemistry of arginine. So they're going to have some aspects that relate them to each other, and we're not going to get bogged down in that, okay? All right, so that's our genetic code. So to do translation in the cytoplasm of a cell, you need not only a messenger RNA, you need a transfer RNA that matches the amino acid and brings it up. Each transfer RNA has an anticodon that matches the codon of the RNA. And, and in what way do they match? They are the complement of each other. So if I have a C, in the messenger RNA, what would that match up with? And it matches with a G. If I have an A, remember we're talking about RNA now, not DNA? It matches not with a T because that would be DNA. Uracil, U. And that matches a chemical compatibility. They hook up to each other very easily because of their chemical shape and charge. Now, there is a third kind of RNA, ribosomal RNA. Ribosomal RNA is what's manufactured in the nucleus of cell, the nucleolus of cells. And then it gets kind of spat out into the cytoplasm and makes ribosomes. Ribosomes are part RNA and part protein. And again, we're going to try not to get bogged down in that, okay? But can you name the three chief kinds of RNA? M, T, and R. Now, in the last five years, we found an amazing array of different kinds of RNA, which are absolutely fascinating and tell such a deep and rich story of protein synthesis that I just, I get excited reading about it, but we're not going to do that in here, okay? So there are all other different kinds of RNA. These are the three that are directly involved in protein synthesis, so they're the only ones I'm going to test you on. All right, so every tRNA has an anticodon at one end and carries its specific amino acid on the other end. So its job is to match the amino acids up to the messenger RNA sequence of codons. And please note that attaching a single amino acid into that growing protein requires an ATP molecule. How much does it cost to make protein? One ATP for every amino acid you stick on. So ATPs, um, you've got to have a good calorie input to do protein synthesis, which is why kids, when they're malnourished, tend to not have very good muscle development. What are muscles mostly? Protein. So uh, anything that causes a uh, reduced calorie intake is going to affect protein synthesis. So here is the structure, sort of a layout of a structure of a transfer RNA. 
And what you see up at the top is that match between the codon of the messenger RNA and the anticodon of the transfer RNA. And what you see at the other end is some specific amino acid. If we went back to our genetic code and looked it up, we would be able to figure out what amino acid that is by looking up this codon of UGG and seeing what the matching amino acid is. Okay, we're not going to bother to do that, but that's what a transfer RNA looks like. It is a single RNA molecule that folds into this clover leaf shape. And then the middle part of the clover leaf is the anticodon, and the tail end is where the amino acid sticks. So it doesn't really look like that laid out clover leaf shape. This is sort of a three dimensional model of what a transfer RNA actually looks like. It twists and folds up. And here in this picture, you can see that this end is going to attach to the amino acid, and here is your little anticodon. Everybody see what the structure of these little amazing little RNA transporters looks like. Okay, so we have three steps in translation, and they're not hard to figure out. What do you think initiation means? Let's start it. And elongation means let's make the protein get longer, and then termination is the stopping. Okay, so that's pretty obvious. All right, so here you see um, a diagram that shows you some elongation going on. And what you'll notice in the background, you see the ribosome. The ribosome has two parts, a bigger part and a smaller part. Here running through it, you see the messenger RNA. And within the body of the ribosome, you see actually three spaces. And those three spaces allow the alignment of the transfer RNAs side by side. They have to sit side by side so that they bring the amino acids close enough to each other to make that peptide bond between them. It's the RNA of this large part of the ribosome that actually is the enzymatic activity. This was very cool when it was first discovered, probably 15, 20 years ago, that it wasn't a protein that was doing that reaction. It's actually the RNA that does it. So cool and interesting. To y'all, it's like, okay, so what? Um, but then the next thing, of course, is that eventually that guy's going to get released. It's going to go pick up another one of the exact same amino acids, and then the next matching transfer RNA is going to come in. So everybody see the steps one by one by one? Questions about that? So when we get to the end, what do we need that lets us know we're at the end? We need a stop codon. So when we get to that stop codon, here comes this different kind of RNA called a release factor. It's not bringing in an amino acid, but it has the matching anticodon. And when it comes in, that makes the ribosome fall apart. It makes the last transfer RNA turn loose and lets your completed polypeptide go off and do its thing. Depending on what protein it is, what kind of cell it is, that protein can fold up and be active right away. It could get transported into a Golgi apparatus where it's gonna get converted to something else and uh, secreted or embedded in a membrane or whatever, okay? So we're just looking at the very, very basic steps here. Any questions about those? This animation, I'm guessing, is probably not gonna work. But I'm gonna go, I'm gonna take care of that by going to the website.
All right, so here you can see the whole process. When the RNA copy is complete, it snakes out into the outer part of the cell. Then, in a dazzling display of choreography, all the components of a molecular machine lock together around the RNA to form a miniature factory called a ribosome. It translates the genetic information in the RNA into a string of amino acids that will become a protein. Special transfer molecules, the green triangles, bring each amino acid to the ribosome. The amino acids are the small red tips attached to the transfer molecules. There are different transfer molecules for each of the 20 amino acids. Each transfer molecule carries a three-letter code that is matched with the RNA in the machine. Now we come to the heart of the process. Inside the ribosome, the RNA is pulled through like a tape. The code for each amino acid is read off, three letters at a time, and matched to three corresponding letters on the transfer molecules. When the right transfer molecule plugs in, the amino acid it carries is added to the growing protein chain. Again, you are watching this in real time. And after a few seconds, the assembled protein starts to emerge from the ribosome. Ribosomes can make any kind of protein. It just depends what genetic message you feed in on the RNA. In this case, the end product is hemoglobin. The cells in our bone marrow churn out a hundred trillion molecules of it per second. And as a result, our muscles, brain, and all the vital organs in our body receive the oxygen they need. Okay, y'all did not get to see that in real time because there's a delay between uh, the iPad and the laptop. So I will post a link to that online for you so that you can review it. Okay, so the reason we go into this much detail for all these basics is so you can understand why things go wrong. There are mistakes in the DNA that result in mistakes in the messenger RNA. These mistakes are called mutations. So there are different reasons that you might have uh, a mutation occur, and we'll take just a quick look at some of those mistakes, or some of the causes of those mistakes. DNA is under constant attack from reactive chemicals and natural background radiation. Free radicals are the byproducts of normal metabolism in human cells. Seen here as bright particles, they sometimes react with DNA and cause chemical changes. Radiation can also affect DNA. For example, ultraviolet light from the sun can cause harmful chemical changes in the DNA of skin. These changes can lead to kinks in the DNA that prevent genes from being correctly read or deletions that alter the type of protein produced. <clears throat> Thanks to constant biochemical repair work, most mutations are corrected before they have any effect. <clears throat> but in rare cases, mutations can accumulate, and this can give rise to diseases such as cancer. Okay, so the problem is mutations, which can be caused by chemicals in the environment, um, radiation, which is why we're supposed to use sunblock when we go outside. And those mutations cause changes in the DNA. DNA is a sequence of adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine. If you hit it in a way that causes it to pop a thymine out, radiation is pretty good at doing that. It just pop, it energizes those thymines and just breaks the chemical bonds and breaks them out. Well, you've got DNA repair enzymes whose job it is to constantly patrol the DNA and when it sees a mistake, to fix it. And because missing a thymine is so common, in general, if it sees a hole, it just plugs a thymine in there. So depending on what the problem is, it can just cut out a whole area if it's disturbed and try to go in and fix it. But for the most part, DNA mutations are either fixed right away or they tend to persist if they're minor, 
or if they break the DNA completely, then your repair process is going to notify the cell this is a big problem. Okay, and just because of cell, internal cell communication, damage to the DNA may be so extensive that the cell actually triggers its own suicide and kills itself. I'm, I'm mutated beyond repair, I guess I should just die, you know, take one for the team. So, um, so that's actually not that uncommon. And as we go into the cell cycle, we'll see where that happens. But um, you've got three different kinds of mutations I want you to know about. Substitutions, deletions, and insertions are changes to the DNA sequence. There are other bigger problems where a chromosome may lose a whole chunk of itself or make an extra copy or move from one chromosome to another. We're not even talking about those yet. Okay, so what do you think a substitution would be? If I zapped out a T but inadvertently put a C in its place, that would be a substitution. If I zap out a T and instead of putting a T back, I just knit together the two broken ends, then I've just popped a whole location out, right? That would be a deletion. If I broke it and didn't delete something, but I thought I did, so I stuck an extra thing in there, that would be an insertion. Does everybody understand the difference between those three? All right, so um, you see a sequence up there, and you see some instructions on what to do with it. So do this in a group to, um, so I have the attendance sheet started today. Start a sheet with your names, the names of everybody at your tables. Start with that sequence there, write that first, then rewrite it as a substitution, rewrite it a second time as a deletion, and rewrite it a third time as an insertion. All right, so if you look up here on the whiteboard, uh, what I've done is I've written them out with red where things are different. Are you with me on the idea with the red versus blue? Blue is the original sequence. So in our first one, pretty clearly, all we did was substitute a C for a T, right? So if you look at the codons, remember each codon is three in a row, right? So here's my first codon, A, A, G. And here's my second codon, which is supposed to be C, T, T, and is now C, C, T. But look at the rest of my codons. Are they the same? Yes, because all I did was flip one nucleotide for another. I didn't change the number of them. Am I right? I think I've probably got something. T, G, C, G, A, C, C, A, G, G. Does everybody see what I'm saying? Every code on the same except the one where I made the substitution. But what happens in the case where we deleted a nucleotide? My first codon is the same, AAG, but what did I do to my second codon? I lost a piece. There were two. I should have what? One, two, right? Okay, so now it's fixed. So my second codon is supposed to be CTT, but what is it? CTA, where did that A come from? It belonged to the third codon, but now because I have a deletion, it becomes part of the second codon. What does that do to my third codon? It shifts it and it shifts all of them all the way down, leaving my last codon missing one, which if that's supposed to be a stop codon, my poor ribosome is sitting there looking for a stop codon that's not there, and it won't stop, and it gets jammed up with this protein sequence that just flat won't let it go. And so you've lost the functionality of your ribosome. Plus your protein's not correct. Yes, I did delete that T. I had two T's. I deleted this T. Third line. That T. Delete the first T. That's the first T. You're using the same code through everything. You're not. It's not changing it. You change them. 
Oh, I forgot a T. Never mind. That's what I did. I forgot a T. There are two T's in the original. There's only one in the case where I deleted the first T. Okay. All right, so everybody caught up with that? So then obviously, inevitably, what happens if I stick an extra T in? Haven't I just shifted the frame the opposite direction? So my first codon is fine. My second codon is fine. But the rest of them, because I have an extra T, an insertion in there, now I have a guy left over at the end. Again, if it's not a proper stop codon, I've jammed up the works. Not only do I not have a functional proton or protein, I've changed every amino acid in the entire sequence, but it won't even let go of the ribosome, right? Yeah. So when you say this jammed up, I mean, obviously, does that mean you quit or Um, it's basically jammed, or it may continue to write, it, because the sequence of the messenger RNA is, goes on a little bit beyond the stop codon. It may, it may write a little bit longer, it may run out, the tape out all the way at the end, but the bottom line is that you have a non-functional protein. It's not going to do anything. Right, right. So I just gave you a very short sequence for the purposes of the class demonstration, but in real life, this is gonna be 120 amino acids long or longer. So you're just gonna have this, this gummed up mess, or even if it does let go, you're still gonna have a non-functional protein, which by the way, your cell has a mechanism to get rid of, luckily, but still, if that's a vital protein, what does it mean to be vital? If you have to have it, you, you're going to die without it. So what we find is that these insertions and deletions, because they shift the reading frame, we just call them frame shift mutations, that they, they are devastating if it's a vital protein. If it's a mutation in a protein that is only involved in, you know, the manufacture of some exotic protein in a cell that's not that important, that's one thing. But if it's the chloride um, channel that we talked about yesterday with cystic fibrosis, then you can see that, that that would cause a fatal flaw. So in some cases of genetic diseases, and in cystic fibrosis, this is well studied, some of the mutations of the CFTR gene, the gene for cystic fibrosis, some of those mutations are just substitutions. And what they do is they make the protein less efficient. So chloride is transferred more slowly, but it still works. It's just not very good at it. And so those are the milder cases of CF. But in some cases, the mutation is, um, just makes the, the little chloride channel just not there at all. It just never shows up in the membranes. And those are the worst cases of CF. So does everybody see how you can have different kinds of mutations just based on the way DNA is made? Okay, so mistakes in the DNA cause mutations. All right, we're going to stop for just sort of a mental break. We're going to shift gears now that we've gone through how proteins are synthesized, and we're going to look at an application um, of the endocrine system. And part of the reason we do this is the state of Texas, in its infinite wisdom, decided the endocrine system belongs in AMP2 instead of AMP1. We can't live without it. It's a vital system. So what, what our response to that was, we're going to teach you endocrine throughout both parts of the course and make sure they have a good grounding in it. So anything that I put in here on uh, the thyroid may show up on your test. So make sure that you, um, that you study the thyroid, okay? It's going to be an application of things we've already studied, some of the themes we've already studied, and pull together, I hope, at least some of what we've been doing. So where's your thyroid gland? It's in the neck. Um, what, how would you describe its shape? Butterfly shape is pretty commonly uh, used to describe it. Uh, bilobed is another way to describe it. The primary hormone of the thyroid gland is called just thyroid hormone very often, 
Um, chemically, it is a small hydrophobic amino acid derivative, which is why we're sticking it in here. So the hormone is a modified amino acid with a hydrophobic R group. What does that mean to you, that it has a hydrophobic R group? That R group, remember, is you've got amino group, you've got an acid group, and then you have this R group. The R group of um, thyroxine, which is the, uh, the chemical name for this, is, is very large and very hydrophobic. Looking at the picture, can you tell that that is hydrophobic? What do you see there? Do you remember the pictures I drew yesterday where I said if it just looks like a hexagon, that it's carbons with nothing but hydrogens attached? Does everybody vaguely remember that? That wasn't yesterday. It was actually the day before. Um, there's an iodide. Iodide is the ion of iodine. Iodine is the element. Iodide is the ion. And you can see the purple iodides shown in the diagram. There's three of them in that picture. That's called T3. There's also a spot where a fourth one can stick. That's T4. So this hormone actually exists in two forms called T3 and T4. T4 is also called thyroxine. And they are chemically interchangeable. Your thyroid gland actually secretes a combination of both. When they get to their target cell, I believe it's converted to T3 before it does anything. And circled in red in your molecular diagram are the amino group and the acid groups, just so you can see. So if that in red is the amino group and the acid group, what's the entire rest of this thing? That's the R group. So in this particular amino acid derivative, the R group's huge and definitely controls the function of that molecule. OK? So can everybody relate that to what you've learned about chemistry? Questions about that? So even though that R group, group looks huge, it's actually, in terms of molecular size, it's pretty small. So we would say thyroid hormone is a small lipid-soluble hormone. It's small enough that for years we taught that it just zips through plasma membranes like cholesterol and the other steroids. I taught that as recently as two years ago. And just in the last year, they finally identified that it has a transporter that the target cells for thyroid hormone have a membrane transporter to help pull it into the cell fast enough to be physiologically active. This hormone is a little different than all the other ones I'm aware of in that it not only has an effect on the nucleus of the cell, it also actually has an effect on the mitochondria of the cell. When it binds to the mitochondria, it causes the mitochondria to start leaking ATP. ATP, of course, is made in mitochondria. We know that. We know we need ATP for almost all of our cell anabolism, making proteins and so forth. <clears throat> So the fact that thyroid hormone makes a cell waste its ATP sounds puzzling until you remember that we are endotherms. What does that mean? We generate our own heat. How do we do that? By breaking down ATP. ATP releases heat. It releases energy, and a lot of that energy is lost as heat. So if you have a patient with a thyroid deficiency, tell me about their body temperature. <coughs> They're pretty cold. If you measure their temperature, it's lower than normal. What's normal body temperature? 
about 98 point something, right? 98.2 or 6 or whatever. Would they also be somewhat higher too? Yes, because they don't have as much ATP because they're, they're just not generating as much. So the thing about your metabolism is metabolic activities are sped up when the temperature is higher. So if you have a lower body temperature, then everything moves slower. Ions diffuse more slowly. That slows down the heart rate. Brain activity gets slowed down. Um, cellular metabolism in general is slowed down. Everything's slower in someone who is hypothyroid. Are you with me on that basic idea? Thyroid hormone is regulated by a negative feedback loop. So here is our application to homeostasis. What do you know about negative feedback? Keeps a parameter in its normal range. The parameter we're looking at right now is how much thyroid hormone is found in the bloodstream. Okay, so we have two hormones that are involved in regulating thyroid hormone. You have a picture of this in your book. I'm going to draw it on the whiteboard for you, even though it won't show up in the recorded lecture. So where's the thyroid? In the neck, what's its shape basically? It's kind of butterfly shape, that's not really butterfly shape. Um, what is the gland that regulates the thyroid gland? Look up at the screen for the answer to that. The pituitary. It's actually the anterior pituitary, not the posterior pituitary. What is the part of the brain that regulates the pituitary gland? The hypothalamus, which is actually the part of the brain that is connected to the pituitary. What is secreted by the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus. Read carefully. From the hypothalamus, we get a releasing hormone, thyrotropin releasing hormone, that is carried through the blood down to the pituitary. What does the pituitary secrete? Thyroid stimulating hormone. Gee, I wonder what that does. It gets into the blood. Where does it go if it's in the bloodstream? Does it all go straight to the thyroid? It's dumped in the bloodstream, right? So the blood from your brain gets drained back to the right side of your heart. It goes out to the lungs. It picks up oxygen. It goes back to the left side of the heart. It goes out the aorta. It goes everywhere. The blood goes everywhere. But of the amount of the blood, the small fraction of the blood, that actually goes to the thyroid gland, that thyroid stimulating hormone does exactly what you thought it would do. It causes an increase in secretion of T4 and T3. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, so that's the stimulatory pathway. Now I have a question for you. How does, TR, how does the hypothalamus know when you need TRH? How does it know that? It's sensitive to the blood concentration of the hormones that it controls. So if you have enough T3 and T4 circulating through your blood, remember these are getting into the blood. Where does the blood carry them? From the thyroid drains back to the right side of the heart, goes to the left side of the heart, oxygenated, goes to the lungs first, then the left side, goes out the aorta, goes everywhere. But the small fraction of that blood that travels up to the hypothalamus then is carrying a certain concentration of T4 and T3. Does that make sense? Okay, so the hypothalamic cells that release TRH are very sensitive to how much T3 and T4 there is in the blood. Are you with me on that? So if there's enough T3 and T4, then you don't need TRH. If the T3 and T4 level is too low, then what? Then you secrete TRH. 
So the way we say that is that T3 and T4 provide negative feedback by inhibiting the secretion of TRH. If you have T3 and T4 in the blood, they inhibit so that you don't, you don't overproduce it. TRH has a stimulatory effect on the secretion of TSH, which has a stimulatory effect on the secretion of T3 and T4, which has an inhibitory effect on TRH. That makes sense to everybody. Any questions about that? All right, so now I've got some questions for you to answer on your sheets of paper to your turn in. You can put the answers in your own notes if you want, but I'm going to give you some time to answer these questions. 